Brandy Station was a doleful looking place. It has two stores, a tavern, blacksmith shop, and no streets, noted Confederate Sergeant George Williams. The tavern specialty gave the town its name. The Gettysburg Campaign was opened actively in Virginia when General Alfred Pleasanton's command crossed the Rappahannock River on the morning of the 9th of June, 1863, at Kelly's and Beverly's Forts, and engaged the command of General J.E.B. Jeb Stewart. The influence of the day's encounter on the great campaign which it inaugurated has never been fully understood or appreciated by the public. Union Colonel Frederick Cushman Newhall. Stay cool, men. Shoot to kill. Captain Bruce Gibson of the 6th Virginia Cavalry at Beverly Ford has 4,500 Union Cavalry, 1,500 Infantry, 16 Cannon crossed under General John Buford, only half of the Union Army present. The other half crossing at Kelly's Ford under General Gregg did not cross until late in the day. Most of the land that you see here in this part of the action of the Battle of Brandy Station is going to take place on the Cunningham property, or what is called Elkwood. Richard Hoop Cunningham came here in 1833 to establish this property. That morning, they were preparing to go over Beverly Ford to continue and start what would become the Gettysburg Campaign. They are going to begin the movement of screening the Confederate infantry as they head to Winchester. Confederates were not expecting to get hit by Union cavalry there at the fort. So these men here, with their horses and the artillery battery, are allowing their horses to graze, to recover from their June 8th review. Well, as soon as the shots ring out at Beverly Ford, oh boy, talk about a mad scramble. They're going to start rallying up their horses as quickly as they possibly can, trying to harness their horses, get their guns off and to the, as, to the west as quickly as they possibly can to prevent being captured by whatever is coming from that direction. Off to my right, sweeping across that portion of the field, uh, aimed towards the lower end of the gun line. And as soon as they're seen, the cannons start belching their, their iron. They're probably not using, does everyone understand the, the different ammunitions that the Civil War artillery fires? There's essentially four types of ammunition. The long range solid shot, there's two types of exploding ordnance that have uh, fuses in them, and then there's the canister. That's the anti-personnel round that turns your cannon into a huge shotgun. So these guns are probably using uh, the shot and shell more than anything at this range. And it's tearing holes in the 6th Pennsylvania. But those men are moving so rapidly, it's difficult for the gunners to maintain an accurate aim range and an accurate uh, line of sight on it. Never rode troopers more gallantly, Confederate artillery captain said of the Union troopers from the 6th Pennsylvania Cavalry and the 6th U.S. Cavalry as they charged the 16 Confederate guns at St. James Church. The terrain there rolls down into a little valley that runs per, uh, parallel to the stone wall, and there's a little valley in there. It is the perfect defilade cover for horse holders. Three dismount, hand me your reins. They're holding the horses. Three can go up. And they are equipped, they are armed with muzzle loading. Muzzle loading muskets, rifles. The bodies of dead and wounded reserve brigade troopers and their horses. And now, coming back from St. James Church, St. James Church, and their where their charge had failed. New York Times and June 11 called it the most splendid charge of the war, the one at St. James Church. Splendid or not, guess what? It was fruitless of victory. So here they come back to St. The, now they've lost their commanding officer, Major Robert Morris, as you know, and the, the commanding officer now, and a good one, is Major Henry Whelan, W-H-E-L-A-N, riding with him is Ulrich Dahlgren, 
an aide to Pleasanton. He's riding with this regiment. He rode with the regiment against the charge with the 6th Pennsylvania Cavalry. Now, he's also here. But, but, but Dahlgren, he swings his regiment around here. Now, this regiment started out with 358 men. They would lose 170. Do you see those people down there? They say, yeah. And they said, do you think you can flank them? And Stevenson says, that's at least double our number. And Oakey, and Oakey says, at least that. And Buford's reported to have said, well, I'm not ordering you, mind you. But if you think you can flank them, drive them out of there. And so now these two captains of regiments, no Adelbert Ames, have to make some sort of a decision here. And in their post-war account, they will say, well, it would be a, a disservice to not take up the challenge for, in front of such a distinguished cavalry officer. This is going to now have Stewart pulling troopers out of the line on the St. James Church Ridge line. Tracy mentioned that once it was solidified and it proved itself, Union backed off and you've got a stalemate. This gives you the tactical opportunity to start pulling off of that line. Tracy will cover that, but then you're going to have a reaction in that way. Pleasanton is across the river. He's going to move up. Tracy mentioned to you about the G house, right across the road there at the airport. Pleasanton will make his headquarters there at the G house. Once that St. James Church line withdraws and, and moves back toward Fleetwood, Buford's now pushing over the top of View Ridge, still trying to make this sweeping motion to come down that ridge and unite at Brandy <laughs> and there at that Fleetwood. Stone Wall. I gotta tell the Roanoke story now. You mentioned it. Lieutenant George Armstrong Custer. It's a lieutenant here. Funny about his brevet, he was breveted a captain by Major General George B. McClellan. He was on McClellan's staff. McClellan's no longer in command. You're not a captain anymore. You're a lieutenant. But as Bud likes to say, do you think he called himself captain? You bet he did. Captain George Armstrong Custer. Custer, as most officers do, have multiple mounts. Lee had Lucy and Traveler. These these command these officers do not typically just have one horse. And this is true for Custer. He had recently acquired a Confederate prisoner by the name of Roanoke, Confederate horse. He makes the decision, and he includes this in his letter to his sister, to ride Roanoke across the Beverly Ford on this day into battle. He comes right across the Beverly Ford. He's advancing with that, that uh, initial advance. You've got the 8th New York going up the road. You've got the, the 8th Illinois, 3rd Indiana. And remember I told those of you that were this morning, the, the company that was picketing that Ford threw obstructions into the road. He's barricades, trying to barricade the road, make it so it's not easily passable for the <coughs> troops. It's one of the reasons why the 8th New York couldn't fan out and get into a battle formation. They're coming up through there in a, in a uh, four wide column. And as the story goes, Custer's riding Roanoke, and Roanoke gets up to the wall and won't take the wall. What that means is Roanoke won't answer the commands to jump the wall. That, in Custer's eyes, ought to have been achievable and something to expect. Hey, jump the wall. Roanoke stops, won't <laughs> take the wall. And I believe he, he relates it as some reflection of his loyalties. <laughs> nope, we're not doing that. And so Custer has to dismount 
and is pulling this horse <laughs> to get it over the wall. Can you imagine? Imagine all the lustrous viewpoints you have of George Armstrong Custer, and you've got a guy pulling on a bridle trying to get this horse to come over this, this whole stone wall. Okay, so Rona. Interesting fact, those of you Civil War aficionados. The boy generals, George Armstrong Custer, Wesley Merritt, Elon Fonjoy, are junior officers, and upon the change of command of the Army of the Potomac, from Major General Joe Hooker to Major General George Gordon Meade, one of the first things George Gordon Meade does is promote three cavalry officers to the rank of Brigadier General. There's your three boy generals. And they all crossed at Beverly Ford Road here today, 160 years ago, there he is. through the same water. All junior officers. Elon Farnsworth will fight along Beverly Ford Road. Wesley Merritt will have a one-on-one -on -one personal duel with Rooney Lee on the other side of U Ridge, right in front of Farley. And George Armstrong Custer will fight his Confederate mount across the stone. <laughs> <laughs>